I know a lot of places have changed a great deal in Europe, but uh, we try to go to those places that look virtually the same. This, we're going to paint the bridge that um, Van Gogh painted that he made so famous, which is exciting. We're going to paint a scene uh, that's kind of funny, really, but uh, they put a bronze plaque in the sidewalk that said, Van Gogh said his easel up here. That may or may not be true, but... Uh, We'll go there. In past years, artist Joseph Sulkowski of Nashville has organized and conducted painting with the Impressionist tours of Europe, where artists, students, and other persons interested in art not only visit, but paint the same scenes as those painted by Van Gogh, Monet, Renoir, Cezanne, and other Impressionist artists. This is Lynn Folk for Tennessee Kaleidoscope with Joseph Sulkowski, who's making another tour like this available, scheduled for the fall of 1986, with Italy and France as destinations. We're going to um, southern France and Venice, and we're going to Aix en Provence and Arles, uh, where Van Gogh did a, a huge body of work in the last uh, 15 months of his life. And then we will be in Marseille and then end up in Venice for the last five days. The reason for Venice, you might be wondering why I should go to Venice, what's that have to do with the Impressionist, but Monet painted there, did some, some of his best work there. And um, southern France, I think, would appeal to a lot of people because of the uh, region in general. And Venice, I think, too, holds a special lure for those who've been to Europe before. And maybe they don't want to go back as tourists, but they'd like to go and see it as a painter sees it. Do the people on your tour actually paint then, or do they just study and, and see all of these places? Well, both. We do gear towards painters, those who want to work in oil, watercolor, pastel, but also to photographers or just those who have the art spirit and want to see Europe as a, as a painter sees it. The um, places we go are those that are relatively unchanged in the last hundred years. It's very in intense two and a half weeks. You, you we're constantly um, on the go, not, not as a tourist where you try to hit two or three places in a day, we'll go to one spot. For instance, we'll be in Renoir's gardens for a day. We'll uh, see his studio and then paint in the gardens. We'll go to Cezanne's studio. Like I say, we'll go to each spot for the day. Uh, we may base ourselves at, a, at the Daniele Hotel in Venice, but we'll go to a um, location to, and paint maybe the back streets one day, or paint uh, a canal scene one day, or paint in St. Mark's Square another day. And uh, we keep everybody uh, working pretty hard at it. And then, of course, we have group critiques, and it's fun for everyone to see what everybody else has been doing. It's really quite intense, and then we'll be visiting museums that relate to the Impressionists and the, the whole school of painting. And I think it, Impressionism in general, has the most mass appeal, we'll say, as a school of painting is concerned, more than any other in, in the history of art. So um, those that come on the trips are usually quite elated by the itinerary and what they've accomplished at the end of the two and a half weeks. Do you serve as the tour guide or instructor? I'm the instructor. The tour guide is there as well to answer any questions or to uh, take people on side trips. Uh, for instance, if they don't want to paint on a particular day but would rather do a little sightseeing, they, they can do that. Due to the specialized nature of a tour like this, it may be slightly more expensive than the usual sightseeing trip, but it offers opportunities for artists to gain financially. Some of the people that have gone over have uh, created enough work to sell when they got back that uh, more than paid for the trip. Uh, one fellow from... Nashville, uh, this last trip, got commissions for paintings he hadn't even created yet. And then uh, not only that, he got, had, got so much material from the two weeks uh, of last year's trip that he, he's just created uh, another 30 paintings or so. Painter Joseph Sulkowski of Nashville. For more information and a brochure concerning the Painting with the Impressionist Art Tour of Europe, contact him or contact the Cheekwood Fine Arts Center in Nashville. This program, Tennessee Kaleidoscope, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the WPLN Educational Foundation. This is Lynn Folk.
you may find pictures of Sam Davis today, but they have been reproduced from portraits that were painted of Sam after his death. When the Yankees came through the Middle Tennessee area, the Davis family, hoping to save their family photographs in case the house was burned, placed all those photographs in a haystack. The house was not burned, as you know, but the haystack was burned. So all their family photographs were destroyed. Immediately after Sam's execution, people began to paint portraits of Sam based on, number one, the way that he was remembered by those who knew him, number two, on what family members said that he looked like, and number three, based on the similarities between Sam and his brothers. Recently, a portrait of Sam Davis has been rediscovered at the historic Sam Davis home in Smyrna, Tennessee. But this one was painted about a hundred years after the execution of the 21-year-old Confederate hero who chose to die as a spy in 1863 rather than disclose the source of information found in his possession. The portrait has special meaning because of the notations of the artist on the back of the canvas. This is Lynn Folk for Tennessee Kaleidoscope with Judy Green of Murfreesboro, a member of the Sam Davis Association board who's uh, spent many hours at this historic spot in Smyrna. She was one of the people who located the portrait. This portrait was found by those of us who were active here at the Sam Davis home. When I say it was found, it was never lost. It had been stored here several years ago by people who had worked here at that time. So it was unknown to those of us who work here now. On the back of the portrait, which is approximately 20 by 24 inches, it says, Artist, Miss Mary King Floyd. Title, Sam Davis, Hero. Date, October 6, 1964. That's the date that Miss Mary King Floyd painted the portrait. And she wrote, I painted this portrait for my father's sake and for the Davis Shrine with much love. And how old was she when she painted the portrait? Miss uh, Mary King Floyd was in her 90s when she painted the portrait. She died at the age of 98 one year after it was painted. On the back of the portrait, she recorded many of her thoughts as they came to her. She recorded things upside down. She wrote over the top of things that she had written on and she turned the portrait all around and wrote anything that came to her mind at different times. Some of it's written with pencil and some of it's written with pen. She wrote on the back, my father, Charles H. King and Sam Davis attended the University of Nashville together and roomed together, later slept under the same tent in the Civil War. They were bosom friends, exchanged visits at Rural Rest and the Davis Shrine. The Davis Shrine was, of course, the Sam Davis home. Miss Mary King Floyd grew up on stories about the Civil War and on stories about Sam Davis, the hero. There's so much written on the back of the portrait. Can you read those things? She wrote at one point, Father gave the first dollar for a monument a few years ago. And this is the monument that now stands on the Capitol grounds. She says, I climbed up to kiss the boot of the statue of Sam Davis for my father's sake. She wrote, I have done my very best to make, at the age of 95 years now, a good face of the noble, brave soldier, our hero, Sam Davis, for the living to enjoy. She said, I made this portrait of Sam Davis to be put over the mantel in his room where he and my father slept. Now, the portrait was not hung in Sam Davis's room because it is not of the time period that the furnishings in the house relate to. The portrait now is in the Civil War Museum here on the property of the Sam Davis home in Smyrna, Tennessee. The entire backside of this portrait of Sam Davis is covered with notes of the late Murfreesboro artist Mary King Floyd. Notes too numerous to mention here, but many of them historically and socially significant. Today's guest on Tennessee Kaleidoscope, Judy Green of Murfreesboro, board member of the Sam Davis Association. This program made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and Choices Restaurant in Franklin. This is 
Lynn Folk. Sometimes um, you just don't don't see a, a stray car and don't see many here and then all at once they're here and gone. And that's about like here and is. It's just in a kind of eye batting uh, town. You close your eyes at one end and you keep it driving you through the other time when you open it. But it is some wonderful people here, uh, white and black, and, and we work together well. Henning, Tennessee is an eye batting town. You can drive through it in the blink of an eye, according to Fred Montgomery, who's lived there since before the streets were paved. He grew up with Roots author Alex Haley, and they've been good friends all through the years. He's assisted author Haley in research for his book entitled Henning. Usually there's not much heavy traffic in this town with a population of about 600, but the day I was there, every car from miles around must have been on the move, while Fred Montgomery and I walked down the main street as he told me about the people of the town and recalled a cherished early days around the Haley family home. That was where uh, he and I played together, and in those days, you. You played with whom your parents wanted you to play with. And you had an hour to return home. If it was 4 o'clock, it was 4 o'clock. It wasn't 5 minutes after 4. If so, they met you with a limb, which was a reminder. And we, he and I both shared with those days. I think that is the thing that keeps us together, the, the past years. And uh, the things that we did and the things that we didn't do, things we couldn't do. You say you played together. Did you play games, or do you remember? We wrestled the... and thump heads and played hide and go see and ran races, jump, what have you. Just typical boy. Uh -huh. yeah. Was he interested in writing uh, in his early? Uh, look, wait till that car goes by. In his early days. I don't. I don't think so. I, I think uh, this thing came about. Uh, being children and, and listen to grand, listen to his grandmother tell of the slavery time and and his aunt Liz uh, uh, created a a dream that that he would go and find where he came from and that was it. Well, after after Russ, I think that it, there was some answers uh, uh, in playing it. Played good for a while, and all at once he'd be gazing way off in the treetops, and uh, we didn't know what it was. I guess that's what it was. I was here when some of this street was bored, and I was here when the streets that you drove cars on was rocked. I was here when there weren't any or uh, very few bathrooms, but there was always something uh, home-like among the people. We knew everybody's chicken, everybody's hog, dog, and most of the women know each other's chickens or roosters and what have you. But that was something that about a country town that ties you together. Uh, if your chickens wasn't fried large enough, you, you could go there and borrow two chickens until you would get large enough or grossness, corn, or anything. And when they killed hogs, all the neighbors got a chance to share in the fresh meat. And another thing, uh, even as it went, uh, I was in the fields to pick uh, wild, well, we call it wild salad, but it was wild green. Uh, if it was anybody sick or couldn't go or something, my mother would cook it and send a bowl of it to them. And those are the things that that really hangs in your life till you die, I guess. Yeah. That's what Tennessee homecoming's all about, too, isn't yeah. it? Uh, we plan a big thing. We're hoping that the museum will be ready to go, and we're going, we plan on uh, quite a celebration, and that'll be on Memorial Day. And uh, we're going to have bands, and we have three races that are close, and that's the white, black, and the Indian. It's our plan that all of us will be here. Yeah, we, we want the Indians to be dressed in their Indian uniform, do their Indian dance, and, and what have Fred Montgomery, looking forward to the opening of the Alex Haley Museum and other homecoming festivities in Henning, Tennessee.
This program, Tennessee Kaleidoscope, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the WPLN Educational Foundation. This is Lynn Folk. I've always considered it one of those statement paintings that are kind of harsh and uh, controversial. And the, the more the years have gone by, I've had more people ask me about it and say they really like it because it's, it says something. It's, it's impact. James Baskin of Hendersonville talking about his painting of an American flag. Recently, it, along with other work by Baskin, was on display at the Hendersonville Arts Council Gallery. This is Lynn Folk for Tennessee Kaleidoscope. When I was at the gallery and uh, talked with Jim Baskin, we discussed his method of painting. He doesn't use brushes, but has other means of getting paint on the canvas, such as applying it with paint sticks or throwing it on and sometimes tilting the canvas and letting the paint dribble over the surface. Also, Baskin takes articles of clothing which have special meaning to him, like his painter's pants and his army shirt, and he makes art pieces of them, gluing them onto the canvas, then painting over them. In addition, he writes poetry, much of that about Vietnam, just as his painting of the flag represents his personal statement on Vietnam. The upper earth, two-thirds of it, is a flat rendering of the flag. It was painted wet in wet, and the red, white, and blue from the flag is, is just bleeding down into this darker blue base. And in this darker blue base, there are some real faint, ghost-like images of skulls that were not intentional. They just happened. There are some uh, crosses on top of this blue background, which represents like a, a small hill. The hill itself represents a lot of the hills that we had to take in Vietnam one day, and then the next day we'd give it back to the Vietnamese people. So the flag painting itself means that we gave a lot and we lost a lot. It's a memorial from me to five of my friends. There are five stars in the flag, and uh, there were five that I lost over there. And so it's, it's a memorial to them mainly. You say those skulls just happened in there. Well, you painted them in, didn't you? Or you mean all of a sudden they appeared? No, I, I didn't paint them in. Um, the painting itself is a real light wash. It's not thick paint. I painted it flat on the ground and then I tilt the canvas up so the paint would run. I know it sounds crazy, but if you look hard enough, well if you look hard enough at any painting, you see things in there that you normally wouldn't see. Well in the, this flag painting you definitely see skulls and they were not intentional. Um, I didn't set out to really make this uh, illustrative type painting. I wanted to do something that was beyond illustration of a flag. I wanted to do something that had feeling to it. Something that you could look at and hate one minute, love the next minute, cry one minute, be happy you know, the next time. You said that doing the, the painting about the flag and everything helped to relieve your tension and your frustration and your feelings about Vietnam, but it didn't completely take it away, did it? Vietnam is something that I always want to keep with me. It's not from some masochistic thing that I want to hold on to it, but it's a memory that's going to be there whether I want it to or not, and a lot of the memories were bad. I did have some, some good times in Vietnam, uh, like on a day when you get a care package in and there would finally be a bar of soap and you could take a bath. There would be a safety pin in there that somebody would leave in and you could patch up your fatigue pants with them. But no, I don't want to forget Vietnam. I could spend the rest of my life doing nothing but Vietnam-related works of art, either writings or paintings. I also try to take my paintings and my writings and, and help other veterans because I've had to go through counseling for delayed stress. And it's not a very pretty thing to sit in a, a group of 30 men and uh, you know, you're sitting around and you're crying one minute and you're in a rage the next minute and you're, you're asking yourself, why did I go? Why don't people understand me? Why won't people even just listen to me for five minutes? So a lot of the Vietnam things that I've done are meant to help other veterans also. The images that I want to portray about Vietnam are universal images of war themselves, but it's also these images and feelings that are particular to Vietnam in its time. It wasn't like Guadalcanal. It wasn't like Iwo Jima. It wasn't like Europe. It was Vietnam. 
It was another world. It was just another world. Artist James Baskin of Hendersonville, Tennessee. This program, Tennessee Kaleidoscope, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and Dale and & Associates, civil engineers, and land planners in Nashville. This is Lynn Folk. I think uh, we are lucky here because our season is completely sold out. So, and uh, this is very, mm, uh, very pleasant and very important because when we uh, play and we have audience, this is the best gift for us. The Chattanooga Symphony and Opera Association's 1985-86 season is completely sold out. As a two-year search for conductor and artistic director has ended with the selection of Voktang Jardonia, who left Russia in 1983 to start a new life in the United States. Making his Western debut conducting the American Symphony in New York's Carnegie Hall in the fall of that year. He later appeared as guest conductor in Chattanooga and then was chosen from a field of 200 applicants after 11 other candidates had served as guest conductors. This is Lynn Folk for Tennessee Kaleidoscope with Voktang Jardonia whose first official Chattanooga appearance as conductor was at a Pops concert in the park, with the audience cheering a well-known local selection. As for the regular season programs, music and uh, guest artists were already planned, but many of his choices are now included. Only it was set up an uh, opera performance when I came here, and as a guest soloist for a whole season, but I changed my programs uh, in symphonic concerts. And also, it was some surprise in first symphony concert. Uh, here came my friend from England, uh, very famous uh, violinist Eugene Sarbu, and he played as a, my guest for oh. audience. What kind of music mainly is on your program? Do you play a lot of Russian music? Um, uh, quite a lot. Uh, I played already Shostakovich, Tchaikovsky, but uh, besides this, I play everything. <laughs> I read in a, a press review that, that you did a rendition of Chattanooga Choo Choo. That was in the park also, and uh, some in other American music, and uh, classical music, German, Italian, so. Were the uh, uh, people of Chattanooga surprised to hear you do the Chattanooga Choo Choo? I think they were pleased because uh, everybody loves this uh, song and also I knew this song when I was uh, ages 9 or 10 uh, after this movie. Did you uh, hear American music when you were in Russia? Music by uh, American orchestras? Yes, I heard of course many tapes, many records and I knew many composers, American composers. Even sometimes I was the first a conductor who introduced uh, Soviet uh, audience uh, American music. I'd like to hear a little about your life in Russia, uh, where you lived. Uh, I was born in uh, Tbilisi, capital of Georgia, um, Soviet Georgia. And uh, I started to, to play piano ages five. And uh, when I was six years old, I went to special musical school in Tbilisi. Then I graduated the school and I went to uh, Tbilisi Conservatory and afterwards I um, moved to Leningrad to study conducting. After I graduated Leningrad Conservatory I became assistant of uh, Leningrad Philharmonic Orchestra under Mravinsky. Uh, then I was music director of Leningrad Radio Orchestra, then Saratov Philharmonic Orchestra and the last six years before I left my country, I was music director of Kharkov Symphony Orchestra, which is ex-capital of Ukraine. And I had a very good orchestra over there, and I had many tapes with uh, this orchestra done. And also I was touring very much around Soviet Union and around uh, social republics like Czechoslovakia, Poland, uh, Romania, and so and so. And uh, 1971, I won international competition and unfortunately uh, after that uh, Soviet government did not let me go out to the West because I had very many invitations. So and then I decided to leave my country 
and to move to America. Has America come up to your expectations? Even more than I uh, thought about this, right? Bakhtang Jordania, conductor of the Chattanooga Symphony and Opera. In another Tennessee Kaleidoscope program, this discussion will continue with his plans for the Chattanooga Orchestra and his new life in America. This program, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the WPLN Educational Foundation. This is Lynn Folk. I'd love to, uh, to work hard here and to make orchestra one of the best. And also I'd, I'd love to touring around the world because it's always very important for musicians to, to go somewhere, to meet uh, another musicians, to meet another orchestra, to meet composers. And uh, even when I don't have tour, you know, I'm hungry to touring because before that I couldn't do it and now uh, I'm doing quite easily. Before Vaktang Jardania left Russia in 1983, he was not allowed to travel outside his country. But now that he's come to the United States and settled in Tennessee, he tours, he has his first house and his first dog, he's riding horses for the first time, playing tennis, and even occasionally flying an airplane. He teaches master classes at UT Chattanooga, and uh, since the spring of 1985, he's been conductor and artistic director of the Chattanooga Symphony Opera. This is Lynn Folk for Tennessee Kaleidoscope, continuing a conversation with him at a visit to his home where the American flag flies in the front yard. Each Chattanooga concert begins with the national anthem, and Jardonia's uh, audiences find something special in his version of it. You know, people uh, in Chattanooga, they uh, liked very much <laughs> my uh, version of uh, national ant anthem, and that's why we are playing uh, before every performance. And uh, I think it's not bad tradition. I think it mm, gets people uh, excited. You say your version. There must be something special about your version of it. You know, I didn't try to do something special, but they said it, is, it sounds uh, unusual for them. Now, when you came to the uh, United States, did you know that you were going to be coming to Chattanooga? No, I, I didn't know anything about Chattanooga. Uh, first, my American debut was uh, in Carnegie Hall, New York. I was in New York uh, almost for two years. And uh, during these two years, I, I had uh, many tours around all of the world. I was twice in Japan, twice in Korea, Venezuela, and uh, one month in uh, Australia, one month in New Zealand, in Europe. So I was touring. And one of the, my tour was in, uh, in Chattanooga. That people invite me to become a music director of Chattanooga Symphony Opera. And I love this area because it's beautiful. And uh, also, I, I always telling that uh, it reminds me of my country because of nature mm -hmm. and because of weather, because my country is also south. Well, you were uh, so fortunate to have all of these engagements. Were these lined up before you came, or did you just happen to have these chances to appear? around this country and, and uh, in these other countries also? Um, no, you know, when I came here, uh, I started from everything from zero because nobody knew me. Uh, and uh, sometimes I had uh, a few concerts, but then it started and uh, it's coming and coming and getting much better. So, and of course, uh, I'm lucky because uh, actually uh, during the one, uh, one and a half years, I got a uh, very good job and also I am uh, continue to tour. I'm going to Denmark, so after that I'm coming back and I have opera here, Rossini, Cinderella. It's rather unusual, I think, for a symphony and an opera to be combined. I think that's what a lot of people hope for, but usually they're separate organizations. Uh, usually they are a separate organizations, but uh, it's very good to have everything uh, together. This kind of orchestra uh, you can see in Europe, uh, in Germany, and uh, sometimes in Italy. And, uh, you know, it's a very good idea to perform opera and uh, symphony. It's very good for everybody, for orchestra, for uh, audience, and for soloists. 
Are you planning to appear anywhere else in Tennessee, either as a guest conductor of an orchestra or with the Chattanooga Orchestra? Uh, mostly uh, I'm touring uh, around Tennessee with Chattanooga Symphony Orchestra, but if somebody will invite me, <laughs> it will be my <laughs> pleasure to go, of course. <laughs> I love to work. Vaktang Jardonia, conductor and artistic director of the Chattanooga Symphony Opera. This program, Tennessee Kaleidoscope, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and uh, Johnson and Higgins of Tennessee, insurance brokers, and employee benefit consultants. This is Lynn Folk. In 1932, my father bought me the first antique gun. I am still vitally interested and have faith by living working with antique guns. This first gun in 1932 was a Colt 1849 pocket pistol that was in such bad shape that it wouldn't work. But I love that gun so much that I would sleep with it underneath my pillow at night time. That was the beginning of Turner Kirkland's gun collection, and by 1938 he possessed more than a hundred guns. Over the years, his infatuation with antique guns continued, and he became the founder of Dixie Gunworks in Union City. In addition, he has an antique car museum here. This is Lynn Folk for Tennessee Kaleidoscope with Turner Kirkland at Dixie Gunworks, where the firm occupies a building covering one and a half acres, which is so filled with rare guns and supplies that it has almost exceeded its capacity. Some of the most unusual guns in Kirkland's collection have already been sold, but he remembers them well. I've had many historical guns, including the Bob Dalton gun, who was a bandit in the 1890s in Kansas. And I've owned the gun he was wearing when he got killed and the hat that he wore with bullet holes in it. Then Lord George Byron was a poet who was ostracized from England in 1812, and he moved to Italy where he continued to write uh, poetry and literature. When he became the poet laureate of England while living in Italy, he continued to write effectively so that he was at that time the most widely read person and poet in the world, and is still widely read. He died in 1827. Uh, he had a pair of dueling pistols made by D. Egg, D as in dog, Egg, E-G-G. -G. They had a, 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 a long heritage of many people owning them from time to time. They were historically oriented with documented papers. Then um, I have owned Jesse James guns and guns of the outlaws of the West. The most interesting gun that I have today is a, the number serial number eight Colt Patterson revolver cased with all accessories that showed up at a Knoxville gun show where it remained in one family near Knoxville for five generations. This gun was the eighth gun made by Samuel Colt. At the present time, uh, we have no other historical interesting guns on hand, but we have many rare specimens. Altogether, we have uh, around 1,400 antique guns that are sold through a catalog that comes out three times a year. The catalog consists of 150 to 175 pages and includes all sorts of uh, antique gun accessories. Our big catalog consists of 550 pages or more and is a Sears and Roebuck style catalog showing replicas of antique guns, shooting supplies, parts and equipment for buckskinners and rendezvous and uh, north-south skirmish team members. Uh, we have uh, over 7,000 numbers in our catalog and in our inventory that fills the, our building that's the size of an acre and a half now, fills it up till the walls are beginning to push out. I suppose you travel all around the country to various gun shows and visiting uh, dealers and collections. There are about five ladies that go to gun shows and four men. Altogether, we go to about 40 gun shows a year, uh, all the way from Asheville, North Carolina, Atlanta, Birmingham, Alabama, Jackson, Mississippi, Fort Worth, to Houston, Dallas, Kansas City, Little Rock, Chicago, 
and all around, all around to Columbus, Ohio. If you notice, I've called off a circle of gun shows within that radius of Union City. And we try to pick those that are pure antique shows, not where they have modern guns. Do you have a lot of tourists coming here to see not only the guns, but the antique car museum? We have an antique car museum consisting of, of 35 cars, and we have about 3,000 people a year that go through. Then we have many more people that come into the gun showroom to look or to buy our parts and supplies and equipment. Turner Kirkland, chairman of the board of Dixie Gunworks in Union City. This program, Tennessee Kaleidoscope, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and Dale and & Associates, civil engineers and land planners in Nashville. This is Lynn Folk.